welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to Makers Demo Day. My name is Leo. I'm one of the technical coaches at Makers. Uh, today we're gathered both uh, on site at our Makers HQ and uh, online via Zoom to celebrate uh, the projects that the January cohort has been building over the last uh, two weeks. So I'm going to first say a few words about the cohort to introduce them as a group, and then each team uh, will present what they've been building over the last two weeks. Uh, so there's going to be four teams with us tonight. After each team, uh, there'll be the opportunity to ask to the audience to ask um, one or two questions, uh, so we don't overrun too much of the time. Uh, and yeah, so to get started, a lot of you would already know that Makers is a 16-week coding bootcamp, um, and it's quite a challenging experience. Uh, and over the course of the time with us, a lot of people go from knowing almost nothing in coding or maybe just some basics that they've been learning uh, by themselves to being able to build like full-blown web applications that then they can uh, deploy and build with other people and go work in teams as well. Um, so I'm gonna sort of address directly the cohort when I say this. You should already be really proud of the work that you've done till now, because if you think about it, um, only three months ago, you were just like starting out your time here and just like without no experience, just like starting to build like small Ruby program, doing test driven development, learning about Ruby classes, doing pairing for the first time, stuff like this. And even if you're not in the software industry, even if you don't know anything about computers or coding, you could like figure how challenging this can be because in the course of like three to four months, you have to learn all these things every week. There's like an avalanche of concepts and of new skills and new behaviors that you just need to digest. And then when you get um, at the end of this week, when you feel you have the opportunity to rest for two days and there's an avalanche of new concepts and new things that you still need to digest. And it's, it's quite hard. There's like not only technical things. When we think of code, we think of like just people coding and doing like uh, technical things on the computer. There's obviously a bit of that. There's like stuff like classes, object oriented programming, debugging pro problems, uh, JavaScript and asynchronous code. Uh, everyone loves asynchronous code, it's such a nice thing to work with. Uh, deployment, stuff like this. But there's a lot of things that people don't usually think about. Um, what people usually call soft skills as if they were less important, where actually they make the difference between a good developer and a great software engineer, which are things like giving and receiving feedback, listening, collaborating, communicating, planning, listening to each other, resolving potential conflicts that happens, uh, and everything that happens, um, which is more to the human side than the technical side. Um, and if all of this sounds really challenging, it's because it is. It takes a lot of uh, work, a lot of work on yourself, a lot of reflection to constantly think about where you were yesterday, where you are now, where you go in terms of learning. It takes a lot of uh, work and a lot of courage. So. Uh, before we go into the presentation, I just want to appreciate the massive work that's been done with the students who are presenting tonight and just give them a massive round of applause. All right, let's get started. Uh, the first team to present tonight is the project Potipal. So I'm going to leave them the floor. Okay. Right. Hello, um, welcome to Potty Pals. Potty Pals is a toilet finding web app. It has a number of features that can be easily accessed from a user interface to generate a list of toilets in a particular location. Um, so this is our team. Um, some of us were already quite familiar with working together throughout the course. For others, it was a new experience, but we sort of fairly quickly developed quite a, a nice relationship within the team. Um, familiarity was good fun. Um, so on to planning. Um, so after we initially had the idea, well, given the idea, had the idea, um, we came to, dis to discuss the concepts of it and present our, presented our ideas after an overnight sleep. Um, bring in all our research and ideas with the team um, and discuss them. We agreed on a tech stack and MVP. Uh, we characterized our main features that we wanted to see from that MVP. 
um, agreed on working practices and we determined our personal goals as well as our sort of team overall goals. Uh, pairs we assigned sort of at stand-ups and also for features and we discussed that at retros also. Um, we maintained our communication throughout and kept co-working all the way through the project. Um, we based the daily sprints on Trello tickets and reviewed the priorities and assigned them, assigned them to teams. So um, from early on, we presented the research and design on a shared Figma board um, and used diagrams to visualize the overall project. So it was easy to sort of understand it when we could break down the database into the requirements for the schemas. Um, we diagrammed the layout, uh, which was a really helpful reference and it allowed us to see how pages and modals would work together. And that again, helped to sort of shape our basic MVP. Uh, for our project timeline, we split it into planning, MVP, math and rating, and then the fun part was wrap up. Uh, so for planning, we had a team meetings to generate ideas and formulate the outline. Uh, we focused on the project setup, granting access to all the shared documents to make sure everyone is um, on the same page. And after agreeing on the framework, uh, we were ready to kick off with our MVP. Uh, for the MVP, uh, we created databases, schemas, and routes uh, together uh, to make sure there is no miscommunication and we all know what's happening. And we prioritized tickets to Trello uh, based on our MVP. We assigned tickets to pairs, uh, which was a productive technique, and provided the opportunity to take ownership, uh, learn from each other, and be pushed when it was needed. And considering the time scale and complexity, tickets were kept basic, um, such as having a toilet or having to use it. Uh, when we reached day six, uh, we moved on to map and ratings. Um, so with unit testing in place and toilets and for the users, OpenStreetMap was integrated into the front end. Uh, we added pop-ups, uh, locations, enabled image upload, and added icons. At the end of day seven, it was feature freeze, uh, which was fun. That was the biggest deadline. And uh, we focused on the debugging and making sure that every, everything was running smoothly. And it was. And the wrap up, that was yesterday and we're still wrapping up today. Um, final commits and merging with uh, GitHub, which usually gives people heebie jibbies and further styling. And last bit was creating the readme file, doing the presentation, a couple of rehearsals and deploying the app live. For the team goals, amongst our personal goals, we agreed on the three main goals, working on React projects from scratch, agree on working practices, and contribution. So as a team, we agreed to build on the knowledge and experience uh, of the past projects without overcomplicating the project uh, by introducing new technologies and new frameworks. And decisions were made to use the main template. This allowed for some comparison with previous project uh, pairs to ownership of features, and that allowed us to work from front to back on the project. As a key aspect of the project was to ensure that um, each team member was able to contribute not only ideas, but hands-on coding that would result in working features and components. And everyone was stretched in the limits that they felt comfortable with. Uh, <clears throat> for our working practices, uh, these four were the main ones, like team-led work, uh, sharing our ideas, pairing, and our MVP. Uh, for the <clears throat> in our team-led work, we maintained a good collaboration and our, through our huddles and scheduling our work. Uh, our sharing ideas was uh, using our Slack channels. We pinned everything on other top, so it was easy access. And our Trello board the tickets were we assigned use uh, people to whichever ticket so they could easily see wherever they were working on. And in terms of pairing, we made sure that it wasn't, if somebody was uncomfortable with an aspect, we made sure that it was somebody more experienced in coding always with them, just so they had that support person there and it would it would be easy to work. And also we had some time for solo work as well. And our MVP, uh, we mainly focused on keeping it as simple as possible because when we first made our ideas, we had so many that it would be easy to go a bit too far. So we have to dial ourselves back and bit, control it a bit. Cool. So our project objectives were to create a platform. 
um, not not break glasses. Um, that was part of the presentation, by the way. Uh, yeah, so it's a great platform for info exchange. So specifically finding toilets, we all need to go. Um, like everyone needs a toilet, and everyone, I think I can see, like speak for everyone. We say you want to go to a clean toilet, and um, one that's accessible, and one that like fits all the requirements requirements you need. Um, so that's what we wanted to do. Like, and that meant enhancing quality of life. So you're not going to a crap toilet, Felix like Sousa pun. And we want it to be inclusive. So we're making sure people can find some more accessible. If you've got a kid, like you need to change a nappy, like you can find someone that's got baby change as well. Um, thank you. Um, so there were three main challenges we ran into in the uh, in the project. And the first one was authentication. Um, we ran into a few issues, um, mainly because I decided to write the routes, at, or just build authentication at 10 o'clock on the night. Um, Terrible idea, but I had plenty of snacks, so it's fine. Um, one of the issues one of the issues we had was like an edge case where the if the browser didn't have the, the user ID or didn't pass it in the request, it would like throw a really mm -hmm. random error and not actually deal with it. And then the user would just like get kicked out, which is not very helpful. So like we had to fix that. I misspelt I misspelt the variable and it took me a good hour to debug it. Um <laughs> that was fun. Um and then the the main one actually came from the fact we had to like rebuild everything because authentication took like it meant all the stuff we'd done so far like had to be rebuilt because you had to like sign news in and make sure we were passing tokens and have a post request. Um and yeah, then that also caused the authentication. I'm to blame for all the problems. Um, the authentication caused problems because we had some hidden potency issues in testing. So like all our unit tests passed absolutely fine, like not a problem, like absolutely banging. And then you run it as a full like suite and it broke, but it didn't break in the same way any, any single time, it broke in a completely different way, which, oh, yeah. So we just brushed past that, um, it works fine. Um, and then time, obviously we, were, we had a massive time constraint, like eight, nine days really to like build like a full featured app. Uh, not easy, but I think I'm, well, I'm really proud of what we've all done. Um, so yeah. This is just a snapshot of, of our testing where it got 90% above 90%. Sometimes it got lower, but this is the one that this is one that passes the thing. But we in our testing, we mainly use Jest and Cypress uh, for our end to end testing and our unit testing. So this is a diagram to show the infrastructure of the whole app. There are three parts like the React app, the server, and the MongoDB. So for the React app, we use we install the package called React Livlet, and also we use the OpenStreetMap to uh, provide the components for us to use in the React app. And for the connection between the uh, server, there are two routes, uh, routes. So this uh, protect one will go through the uh, token checker, and the public one will just go straight to the server. And we use the uh, external API to translate the uh, address to the geolocation and save to the database. So this is the whole infrastructure, how this Polypal works. So as for the system we use uh, for the front end, we're basically using the MERN stack, like the front end you use React, uh, Tailwind CSS for styling, and then Cypress for testing. For the back end, we use uh, Express, uh, MongoDB, and just for testing. And for the other tools, we use Slack for communicate, and we use uh, Figma to build a prototype to make sure everyone uh, knows what we are going to do and throw bot to our side tickets. And of course, chat GPT to solve many of problems of us from us. So we should give it a <laughs> Everyone should use how to use it. Yeah. Okay, it's live demo time. So oh, oh it's yeah. not we just stole someone else's app. Like sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is the one we have. So this is the layout of the whole app. So um, we re pre-recorded, so I will explain in a way. So this is the uh, layout. So you can click the button on the map and it will show all the uh, toilet layout uh, or toilet details on the map. And you can zoom in and zoom out. On the left side, you can click uh, the list to go to a toilet page. In the toilet page, there are lots of details, uh, including the overall ratings and other, also the reviews. So we should go back and there are filters on the home page. You can toggle the filters to like filter some toilets out based on the features. So in enough bar, you can click the login, of course. So I've already have a uh, account. So I just log in. And then after login, uh, you can add a new toilet. So I just type any like price name and also the address. So this one is the real address. And, and also you can upload a photo or image to it and submit. 
and the new toilet will be displayed on the top of the list. So you can click, you can now click it in the map and also uh, on, the, on the list. So now it's time for us to add a review. So I just type random is a task and give some um, marks to it. So there are four categories for the rating. So when you submit the reveal, they'll automatically uh, calculate all the overall overall ratings for you, and also the timestamp here to show uh, what when is it posted. So of course, when you log in, you can also log out. So there's a button to have you log out. And if you don't have any new account, don't worry. You have a button here to sign up a new one. So I would just like new and new. Yeah, sign up. And let me prove you to you is a totally new account. So we go to the same toilet and we make another reveal and submit it. And it will automatically refresh and then pop up at the bottom. So that's it for our app. Let me go back. Yes. So we all we all we all we also deploy our app on the render. So this is the link and also the QR code. You can use your phone to scan it. And I think this is the end of our presentation. Thank you for your attention. I think the Q and A question, right? Any yeah. Any questions from there? Yeah. Sure. Um, when uh, you mentioned some of the like the challenges you had, and it was really like cool and really reassuring to hear. Um, but what what would you say were some like really great moments or some bits you're really proud of uh, uh, like yeah this is awesome uh, me and Marie we did that we were responsible for the pins on the map oh, and right. we were having like a lot of funny issues but we put it the other way around and our toilets were appearing in Somalia in Africa yeah. so, geolocations yeah. the latitude uh, longitude were like yeah. flipped and the, this doesn't make any sense well once we had it working yeah. it was just like That's... a wow it was like a little celebration that was a special for us. Time. yeah yeah <laughs> Which is a good question. Yeah. Oh, student question. Yeah. I mean, oh, oh. Um, <laughs> how are you arriving using Airbnb, presumably through an API? Where is the actual application? Oh, oh, Airbnb is a config from from Airbnb. They they have the rules to how to construct your uh, React. Like we use with the Eastlink. So so you in, implement the Eastlink with the Airbnb config, and it will automatically format with Prettier. So it will automatically format all the codes for you. So based on, because I think they force you to use the pro, prop types. So you have to like a TypeScript thing, you have to stay all the types. So yeah, we use that. So yeah, it's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'll send you the link. <laughs> yeah. Right, well done to this first team. Thanks for presenting and thanks for the question from the audience. I'm not going to call the second team. We should team of them. It should work. It should work. Yeah. Have we been joined? Do we know if they're there? Can we see who's here? Uh, I'm here. On. Are they all there? Okay. Who is? Can you hear us? Cool. Hello. Good evening. Hello. Hi. Um, in retrospect, we probably should have gone the other way around because we're going to be now dealing with food. Um, <laughs> but it's fine. We didn't know. Um, so we are Team Eat GPT. My name is Cassius. This is Adam and Max. And we're joined by our teammates, Samira, Shamima, and Uzair, who are in the cloud somewhere. Um, I would ask. Hi, guys. Just... Can you hear us? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. <laughs> just disembodied voices at the moment, but that's fine. Um, so yeah, we're Team EGBT. Um, we were we sort of set out with this project to create a version of a site that a lot of you will be familiar with already, which is you know if you've got like loose ends, various pieces of ingredients, pieces of food you've got left over, and you want to make something from those ingredients, you know there are systems out there to do that. But we decided to take that idea and expand it into what we kind of call the combined recipe generator slash culinary social media for both time poor chefs time poor cooks rather like me um, and show offs which I'm not at all of course um, so a bit of top line statistics on the um, on the process by which we've arrived here so 
as, as the other teams will have done, three two-day sprints. We've um, obviously, yeah, that commits number is actually a bit higher now. Um, but yeah, to give an idea of the amount of work that's sort of gone into the, um, into the finished product, um, I am going to theoretically hand over to Shamima to do the demonstration of the inside of the technology. Um, Shamima, are you ready to go? Yep. Hi, everyone. So this here is our homepage. We've gone for a vintage aesthetic. Um, I'm going to click on vanilla, egg, milk. And as you can see, the items are checked. Hit submit. And this renders a list of recipes that you can choose from. You can also navigate to other pages. Um, don't really like the look of that one, so I've gone for cranberry nut cookies. So this is our recipe detail page with the ingredients, method, and nutritional values. You can also log in, but we're going to start with signing up. So I'm going to call myself Gordon, Gordon Ramsey. I'm sure the password will be a curse word. And then you can log in. So this takes us to our profile page. We can add a message here. And then we can also add a recipe. So I'm going with brownies. I'm going to write a description of chocolate gooey goodness. Add your ingredients and a quantity. You can add instructions. And then the cooking time and prep time. This will calculate a total time, which will um, save to the database. So dessert, and it serves 10 people. You can also upload an image and submit recipe. And that's now in the database. Thank you for watching the demo. I got that hit as well. Um, okay, right, now where do I do? I build password authentication, but I can't make this work. There we go. Right, now I'm gonna pan pass over to Azair to talk about the process by which we arrived at our minimum viable product. Yes, thank you. So we were given three days to have our MVP up and running basically. And there was some initial pessimism in the team due to the short deadline and a major part of the early days being spent on planning. However, we did some good planning, some good discussions as demonstrated by our mock-up here, which demonstrates two of our main pages, after which we had a few good coding sessions, good flow, good work. And thankfully we were able to have the MVP up and running half a day early. But when I say half, halfway through the day, we had MVP running. And now I'd like to hand it over to Samira to speak more about the team and elaborate further on that. Hi everyone. Um, I'm here to talk about the objectives of our team and the working practices. So the first thing that we discussed as a team was the term, the stack that the tech we wanted to use and everyone basically, we all agreed that we all wanted to work on the merge stack. And apart from that, the testing knowledge, because we haven't, we hadn't actually tested the front end and the back end rigorously. We didn't have much knowledge about it. So we wanted to get some more, you know, solidify our previous knowledge of, uh, of the Cypress and Jest. And in, by, for the working practices, stand up at 10, like all the other teams, retro at 4.45, unlike all the other teams. <laughs> and every day we tried to lead the, all the meetings by different members and all the Git push was were done into the main after getting at least two reviews. And I'm gonna hand it over to Max now. So I'm going to talk to you about the, uh, the database aspect of our application because it was quite it was a, it was its own project in in a, in a way. So our initial um, approach was to use APIs and we scoured the internet to find any API that could return us all the information that we needed. Uh, but we found that the APIs that we found didn't return the information that we needed, or the ones that did were paid subscriptions. Um, so we moved on to MongoDB Atlas, which is a cloud-based um, service. And we found a data set, um, which it was a major data set and it's like industry level. It, it contained about 
520,000 objects and all recipes. So it was, it was a major scale database that we had to do, uh, deal with. So uh, we pushed all the information up. We had to convert from CSV to JSON in order for that to work. Um, and we, we're running it now. So hopefully we'll deploy it and you can use it someday. Anyway, passing over to Adam for the cool. uh, Yeah, so talking about some of our challenges, one of our major goals was for everyone to get more testing knowledge. Um, unfortunately, that was a kind of like, a, uh, it didn't really work. Um, and you may have noticed that we haven't given you a screenshot of our test coverage um, for good reason. Um, lots of our Cypress tests were fine. Our backend tests were mm, nearly non-existent towards the end. Um, but you know, there's um, always a learning there for everyone. So I'd recommend if you're about to start a project, test often, test early. Um, the only other challenge that we had was really around our logo. Um, logo wars were continuing into yesterday. Like we've got a, a really harmonious team, but <laughs> new people kept popping out of the woodwork with their suggestion for what the logo should be. Um, Cass has had to swallow pride. I lost, bit. I lost the logo. Um, but, but I think we're, we're all happy with with what it is. Um, there's no AI in our product, despite the name of each EPT, but I think it made everyone laugh. Um, and I think you said it pays homage to the- Our uncredited eight team member, yeah. as Terry did earlier on yeah. as well. So um, yeah, that's that's basically, I mean, I quite like the new one actually, but um, this is a, oh, that's you as well. Yeah, it's me, but it's, it's fine. Oh, that's, sorry. Why well, don't we talk about it anyway? It's, it's literally, this is the same screen you'll see from everyone. They might have logos on there, but we've got the words written so you can read them if you're not familiar with the logos. These are the technologies that we've used and you'll probably recognize that they're quite similar to the same ones as everyone else because that's what we've been learning. Thanks. <laughs> and this is also what you'll see as well. We're all obviously going to fit to the same timeline, but broadly speaking, this is the top level view of, of how we got on over the last well, seven days really of actual coding. So starting last Monday, um, where you saw the wireframe that we showed earlier on that was there, walk you through, uh, organizing the initial sprint and sorting out what the kind of MVP was supposed to be. We managed to get that done on time on Wednesday, which was, which was very good, um, which gave us the second sprint up until Friday to do the user side component. So to turn it from the recipe generator into the social media aspect. Um, and then obviously over the weekend, I think we did probably more work than we should have over the weekend really, because everybody has to relax. Um, but we spent the third sprint, which was Monday, Tuesday, a little bit of yesterday, um, designing, debugging, trying to get our test coverage up, certainly in the front end as well, um, and to deliver it and show it to you today. So that is on time. And, uh, and I will leave you with the best commit message from the entire project. <laughs> We're not entirely sure what the context of this was, um, but you're forgiven for whatever it was. You'll never know. I know, no, I don't think you will either. Um, and there you go. Thank you very much. That's the Git. Um, do you want to have a look at the code? I know what your answer is going to be. Yeah, I think that um, even though we wanted to have a bunch of recipes available, I think that tying ourselves to an existing data set had kind of like set us down a path which caused problems. And I think that maybe just building it from scratch and, and hoping then that users would build up that sort of, you know, collection of recipes for us would have probably caused less problems for us and given us a bit of a clearer structure to start. Oh, and testing. <laughs> testing, well, yeah. Testing, yeah. yeah. I think for me is um, I would have probably gone down like Postgres SQL route instead of the MongoDB because I do like to work with SQL language um, instead of no SQL language. So yeah, I would agree with that to be honest. I think the scare, the the the, the, the kind of power of what we built is in the amount of data that we're dealing with and the spe this kind of technical spe specificity of what we've built is to deal with that amount of data, the, not just the, the number of records, but also the size of the objects we were getting back. The recipes contain loads and loads of information. So that was really, honestly, these two have put in a, a real marathon to properly finesse that search. But yeah, in, in retrospect, we probably could have just gone with the best API we could find. Um, there are a few, but they're not that, you know, we were being perfectionist, I think, at the beginning. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. I, I would not let Cass design the logo. Sorry, Shamima. Oh, is that Samira? 
Yeah, no, I was just, if I had to do one thing differently, I wouldn't let Cass design the logo. <laughs> Wait, what? She was like, do the logo. Do the logo. Do the logo. <laughs> uh, mine was yellow, okay? I, I admit that it wasn't perfect. <laughs> and there was a CD. I don't know why it was CD. I don't know either. We were, we were tired. Uh, if there's time, if there's time, I'd like to ask a question. Oh, um, there's a question in the... <laughs> can, you, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, sure. So um, you said there were like 520,000 recipes. Uh, I noticed your recipes rendered very quickly upon searching with ingredients. How did you manage to go through that much data that quickly and also rend all of those recipes? I think that might be a question more pointed to us there because he implemented uh, pagination, which only displays 10 recipes per page. Um, and it tracks the uh, what recipes were already been displayed. So if he's there, he might be able to um, abbreviate on that. No, no, I think I think he's, he's there's gone. Okay, I'll, I'll look. I'll, I'll look into pagination then. Thank you very much. Yeah. It's very interesting. I think it's a Mongo um, function. Yes, you can limit the amount that comes back from the database. But okay. I don't think I'll reach the back end. That's that. I can't. That's not that. Hmm. Oh, guys, there's another question in the chat. Right. Thanks, team. Uh, let's go on to the third team tonight. <laughs> That's your turn. Hello guys, how y'all doing? That's good, that's good. So uh, we made a yes. Japanese RPG game. Made a Japanese RPG game. Our team name is Team Densha. Does anyone know what that means? Actually, someone actually does. Train. Correct. How do you know that? That's crazy. Okay, yeah. Well, it means train because we come into the office. We, we commute. So that's what we do. As you can see, these are our numbers. We have three, two day. Oh, you can read it. We have a lot of numbers. So um, we were pretty hardworking. Okay. So this is the dream team. We have Anna over here. We have Ed over here. We have... James on the computer. We have Luke over here and we have myself. Yes. <laughs> this is the project goals. So um, obviously we wanted to make a good product, right? But we also wanted to achieve something other than just the app. Um, so we want to keep learning, obviously. That's why we're here. We wanted to keep learning. Uh, we want to have good communication because that's a very important skill to have in this type of environment. Uh, we want good code quality and review so that, that um, equates to like testing um, and how pretty the code looks um, and review. So, and we also wanna present a very well-finished product because that would be nice. And we wanna have a cool final project to present. So that's why we chose a Japanese RPG game because it sounds pretty fun. Like everyone wants to learn a new language, but it's kind of hard to learn it in a cool way. Like Duolingo is pretty uh, bad. Uh, and we want to have fun. And that's what we did. We had a lot of fun because this is not just a dream team, but we're like really good friends now too. So yeah. And this is the team values. Uh, pretty self-explanatory to be honest. We don't really need this. Thank you. Yeah, so during our planning, we talked a lot about the working practices, like when we'd have our meetings and so on. And we were quite flexible on that. Um, you can see Ryan's amazing drawing skills there. No, Matt. Um, and every day our meeting was led, our meetings were led by a different team member. So everyone had a chance to get involved. And we decided that two people would do, um, would review the pull requests before merging to main. Um, so we decided to go solo by default, but if there was something particularly difficult, then we'd work in pairs on that. And I think working in the office together was making, like it would make communication a lot easier. 
Um, so it was really easy to ask for help, um, get the group opinion or something. Um, and yeah, so we decided that like each person would be responsible to keep up with the code and understand like what's going on during the project development. So, yeah. Okay, so um, <clears throat> so here is our timeline for our development process. Um, because we need to finish the whole project uh, within less than two weeks. So for the first day, we decided to spend the whole day to uh, spend time on planning our project because we think um, with a strong foundation, it is really important. So on the first day, we try to lay out all the user stories, all the feature we want to implement. And then we start to draw some like design uh, diagram, but also like the mock-up diagram. And, um, and then on the next day, we start to work on the development and uh, we try to follow the agile uh, workflow. So we'll have a true bot to, um, to track all our tickets. Um, we have three springs in total. And for our very first MVP, we try to make the simplest thing we can do. And then we build on top of it. And then um, within maybe six or seven days, we kind of finish all the feature that we want to implement. So it's kind of uh, the point of the uh, feature freeze. I think we did quite a good job for the time management. And then so for yesterday, we just do a little bit more styling, debugging, and a little bit testing. And today we are able to show you the uh, demo video later. And here is the mockup that we draw on the uh, schedule. It's kind of like complicated and a lot of like at the beginning, we kind of scared, oh, are we really able to finish the whole thing? So, but this is the ideal plan that we had. So uh, we try to um, circle some, some uh, feature that we think is important for our very first MVP and then we build on top of it. And also besides the uh, mockup diagram, we also have some um, folder structure that we all want to like follow for our team and some like naming convention about the file name as well. And then I will pass to Edward. So at the start, because we decided to do a game, we had some options. We could use a game engine. Um, we considered Pygame as one example. Mm -hmm. But in the end, we decided to use the Mern stack because we'd already learned it on our past project. And we thought we all needed to kind of strengthen what we'd already learned. So in addition to Mern stack, we used a couple of different front end um, libraries. So Redux Toolkit and Redux Persist. This is because we noticed a couple of issues with state management in the previous projects. So we thought we should include something like this and then for CSS, we used um, Tailwind, Headless UI, and also Hero icons. And then for testing, we used Cypress and Cypress MongoDB. And I'm going to pass over to James for the back end. Hi. Um, yeah, so uh, we used uh, a few back end technologies you've probably seen in some of the other pre uh, presentations. Um, Nodemon to keep, uh, to keep our back end refreshing as we change code without restarting the server. And then uh, paying special attention, I suppose, to Super Test, Jest, and Postman, all helping us test in different ways, making sure that our things wouldn't break. Um, then, then on to project management, uh, we kept everything very organized in our project. And I think we really benefited from that. Uh, we had a Notion site where we had links to our Trello board, where we kept up to our tasks. We had uh, our Scala draw linked on there. And uh, we also had like our team documents linked on this notion as well, uh, our charters and things like that. And then, of course, we communicated on Slack throughout. Okay. And uh, now, uh, obviously, in Makers, one of the most important thing is about testing. So uh, for the front end, we use Cypress. Uh, we try to write uh, every component test with uh, each React component at the beginning. And after we develop some features, we try to write each e test to simulate the user experience as well. And then for the back end, we use uh, Jest for testing to write a unit test and integration test. And uh, we have a code coverage for 99% at the moment. It is still like 97% in the afternoon and it's still coming up. So yeah, and credit for James, like he worked hard this afternoon to try to make the lumber go up. Yeah, and then uh, we will move to the demo video, which is like voiceover by... Hello and welcome to our Japanese learning game. So this is the homepage that you're greeted with when you start the app. As you can see, we are on the homepage here. There's no roots because this is a single page application. So we can go ahead and sign up. We can make an account. 
and then we're instantly greeted with a design your character page. So here I can choose the style that I like, and then when I'm happy with it, I can submit my style and I'm taken to a cutscene. So the concept of the game is that our user wakes up in Japan and they suddenly need to learn Japanese. So this is the user's bedroom. This is the core component where we can click off to all different parts of the game. As you can see, because we're a new user at the minute, our level is one and all of our stats are basically zero. If we go over to our bookshelf, which is where we can see the words that we've learned, there won't be anything in here currently. But if we want to go and study at the study desk, then we can learn some new vocabulary. So I need to answer 10 questions. At the top, we're shown Japanese, and then we have to guess the English. So let's see how many I can get. Not too great so far. Okay, 5 out of 10, not too bad. So we earn coins for every game, as well as the new vocabulary that we learn and the XP that we earned. So XP is dynamic and it depends on whether the word was new or old. Since they're all new words, it was 10 XP per word. If we go back to the bedroom, we can see that our stats have now updated. And if we go to the bookshelf, we can see the new vocabulary that we've learned. On this account, I can't show the shop and wardrobe because I don't have enough money. So I'm going to log into a different account now. In the hamburger menu, we can also toggle music on and off. Once we toggle the music on, it will play on any page. We have a soundtrack that's roughly 15 to 20 minutes and it loops. So now I'm going to log into a different account. As you can see, Luke's played quite a lot more than me. He has uh, a lot more coins and XP. So the current wardrobe has three default clothing. If we want to buy something new, we can go over to the shop. We can preview which outfit we want to buy first. And you can see the preview at the top right. And then if we want to buy the green t-shirt, we can. Our coins will go down. The t-shirt will sell out. And then if we go back to the wardrobe, we can now equip our new green t-shirt. Also, if we want to see our stats in a little bit more detail, we can go over to the stat bar and click it and a modal will open. Here we have achievements too. So currently the only achievement Luke has is an XP achievement. However, there are other achievements that you can earn. Thank you for watching our demonstration. Hello and welcome to our Japanese learning game. And, and that's it for our presentation. So uh, if you have any question, please feel free to ask us and enjoy our working photo. It's kind of a cool question. Yeah. The test covered is great. What's happening on line 12? Like that one Let me see. Oh, yeah, I can, I can talk oh, about James, that. Uh, James said something. Yeah, so that's the one line in the back end that can't be tested right now. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I'll get to it. <laughs> Hundreds of lines of code, and that's the one I just couldn't quite, couldn't quite get to run through just. Um, oh, I'll move on. No, it's not that Um, for the characters specifically, we got um asset packs with sprite sheets, so it has you know like every single image of, um, say, the body, like an animation for like walking or whatever. And then, um, so there's like thousands of little images. And so you have to know, you have to put in exactly how wide, yeah, um, each thing is in pixels and then scale it up um, and like layer that with the clothes. So yeah, it's, I don't know if that explains it very well. <laughs> it's much, yeah, more complicated than I thought it would be. <laughs> Ooh, all 
All right. And last but not least, Team Tenant Talk. I'll leave you the floor. All right, hello everyone and uh, welcome to Tenant Talk and um, we are your final presentation for the evening and um, Tenant Talk is a review platform for prospective, current and prior renters to uh, write and read reviews on rental properties. First thing you're probably thinking right now is another orange theme project. <laughs> this was a surprise to all of us in the cohort. Uh, I promise this wasn't planned or mandatory in the cohort in any way. It just seems we all have the same mindset and maybe we're influenced by the maker's logo, which is orange and white. Um, as you've seen, there are a lot of great teams with a lot of super thorough and detailed presentations. Um, in all honesty, before we get started, um, we had a little bit of a different plan when we came in today, which didn't pan out when we came into the office. Ours is a bit shorter to be candid, um, but we've made sure to include everything that you need to know um, in our team. Um, this is our little, this is on our about page on the website. So bright and airy London studio apartment that's actually a cupboard in Clapham. Don't worry, we've got your back. We're Tenant Talk and we're here to change the way that you find your next rental home. Find honest reviews covering landlords to locality, parking to pets, and mo much more from folks who've actually lived there. In our team, obviously got myself, we've got Miranda, Dora, Haley, and Joel here. And, and with that, Miranda's gonna take us into the timeline. All right, so moving on to the timeline, again, very similar, because we all live the same for two weeks. Um, so March 24th, founded the project. Um, this was the day our team was formed and Tenant Talk was born. March 27th, secured zero million funding, um, but who needs a budget when you've got five junior devs and a deadline? Um, wireframes, models, diagrams galore, day one of our final engineering projects began. Um, March 31st, we completed our MVP, kind of. Um, given our limited time, we took extra care to ensure that the functionality we built was not just box sticking for the MVP, um, but it was clean, reusable and scalable, which allowed for quick implementation of additional functionality later on. Um, and finally, today, the global launch of the product, Demo Day. We're here, you're here, no, one's, no one on the team has had a breakdown just yet. Success. And for our approach and values, the problem we solved is, I guess we can all relate. We've all had pretty bad rental experiences um, and not really a place to talk about it, I guess. Um, so basically renters can read sales pitches on a website all day long, but it's not until when they move to a property, usually a 12 month term, that they really find out what they need to know. How did we solve it? By allowing renters to leave reviews of properties they have rented. Cold house that inflates, the gas bill, neighbors at party all weekends. You can find all this and more at Tenant Talk. We took a user first approach. A website like this doesn't, exhaust, doesn't exist without the users. We put them at the forefront with sleek, intuitive design choices and functionality that matters without overcomplicating the process. I'll just talk quickly about our team values. Um, so in terms of a supportive team, um, we're fortunate that our team had established close working relationships throughout the course. So this allowed us to have a friendly, fun-filled working environment to uh, help overcome the stress and many challenges that we faced. Um, finding a balance of learning while still producing great work on a deadline has been extremely tricky. Um, we all agree that whilst we wish we could have spent more time learning, we probably wouldn't have the polished product that you'll see in a moment had we prioritized that. Um, and then finally, in relation to our downtime, so the midnight oil, the candle at both ends, whatever it was, it was definitely on fire. Um, ensuring that we respected each other's downtime was key to getting through the project and being able to give it our all. I'm going to hand you over to Joel now for a, a brief demonstration. Okay, demo time. So, so when you land on our application, you'll be greeted with the landing page, of course, which shows the nav bar at the top and also a search bar so you can search for address. But before we do any of that, we're going to sign up for an account because in order to view any reviews, you have to have an account, a bit like Glassdoor. So first we're gonna create an account and you can see we've got four validation for all the fields, such as the right search And here 
you'll see the profile page where you can update any of the information you just submitted when you created your account. And now we'll go back to the properties page and you'll see that on this page, you can see all the properties in our database as we haven't yet specified an address to search for. But once we do actually specify an address, it'll show up a property if that property has reviews. And if you do, you can click on the property and it will show more detailed ratings about that property, uh, which come from averages from all the reviews submitted for that property. And if you click on a specific review, you can see the specific details that the reviewer has left for that property, including an image that they can upload. And so if we head back to the properties, here is searching for a property that does not exist in our database, and it will tell you such, and you can create a new review for that property from there. And when you create a property, a review, sorry, the first thing you'll need to do is specify an address to review. If the address is in our database, then it will show a green tick. But if it is not, then it will show a blue plus to show that you're creating a new review with that property. And here is where you leave the comment for your review. And we've created a page just to show some tips on how to write a review and to give you more information about how to understand reviews, because sometimes just star ratings from one to five can be a bit ambiguous. So this lets you know what a one or a five or a three might actually mean. Um, so here you can see, you can select the amount of stars with the star selectors and select whether you got your deposit returned or whether the place allowed pets and you can upload an image and it shows a little preview of the image right here. So you can submit and so you get a little pop-up to say it submitted and it takes you to the page for the property you just created and you can click on the review you also just created. So let's take you back to the property page. And I believe in a second, we're gonna go to a little preview of what our app looks like on mobile. Because we use Tail Tailwind CSS, it allowed us to very easily adapt the layout of our application to work on mobile as well as desktop. So you can just see it has a slightly different look to it. Uh, pages have a bit more of a stacked aesthetic rather than being spread out horizontally. And you can see that we have a little drop down menu instead of the usual nav bar um, buttons along the top. And here you can see the profile page with its different view and the properties page. And that is it. Thank you for watching. Thanks. Are there any questions or comments here? Of course, you do. Can I see it? Um, if you had more time, what would you add? Tests. <laughs> yeah. Tests. Probably, yeah. Obviously, it's such a positive uh, product. It's really, really good. What were like your um, big challenges, I guess, with anything, you know, your powers, you know, the part technical part work done? Um, sorry? Story out of this. No, oh, that was okay. <laughs> um, I think. Like one of the big things we weren't sure about at the start was how to find and store addresses. So we like searched through loads of different, well, we had to search through loads of different API, possible APIs, which we could use for like auto-completing addresses and such. Um, lots of them turned out to be paid, but we ended up going for the Google Places API, which gave us like loads of free credits, which we were able to use. And it just meant that we could easily standardize the addresses coming into our databases and also the addresses that were being queried to search our database. So that solved a lot of issues for us, at least. Okay, well, I think we can just give an extra round of applause to all the teams that have been presenting tonight. Okay. Okay. Uh, really, really proud of you as a coach and kind of really looking forward to see where you will be going next. Um, we last summer, we organized a community party with makers when uh, there was 10 degrees more and the sun was shining a little bit more. And that uh, the reason I'm mentioning this is that the name of this party was um, 
wants a maker or ways of makers. And we used to say that not because we're a cult, but because we generally like want you to still be part of the community, like as an alumni and later. Uh, so don't be a stranger. Keep in touch with us via Slack, via LinkedIn, via anything. Uh, you're welcome in the building as well. So even if you finish the course, you're still part of the community. It's still like a lifelong learning experience you're um, going to. So uh, yeah, definitely keep in touch with us. Um, I've heard a bottle of Prosecco topic there. So it's a really good segue into saying if you're on site in the room, there's drinks and food. And if you're on site, um, not on site, if you're online with Zoom, uh, stay around if you're interested in joining makers or want to hear a bit more about uh, our learning philosophy. And I believe Rachel from staff will be with me to host the Q&A for about uh, the next 30 minutes or so. Otherwise, if you're in the room, uh, feel free to get some beverage, uh, food, and I'll see you in a bit. Thanks, everyone. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining the Q&A. So Rachel should be joining in a minute. So uh, I'm going to start going through the questions. Um, let me just open the Q&A uh, box. OK, so there's no questions so far, but if you want to ask any questions about uh, makers, about how we teach here, or if you're interested in joining, feel free to uh, type in an answer, uh, a question, sorry. I'm just going to... Uh, uh, Hi, um, sorry for the wait, everyone. Um, just get everything settled in the on-site demo day. Um, but yeah, I'm here to answer any questions you have about the application or uh, just you want a bit more information about what Life at Makers is like. And Leo, as he probably said, can answer more technical questions. Um, I don't know if we've got any questions at the moment. Yeah, so there's this one, which is a follow-up from the previous one. Okay. So how do you get in touch with admissions? So the best thing to do would be to, um, if you go to our website, you can book a call with our core sales team. So we have three people in core sales and what they'll do is they'll have an initial chat with you. You can do your application before if you want, or you can do it after. And they'll just ask you some general questions about like your personal life um, in terms of like what you enjoy just doing outside work just so you get a better grasp on what you're like as a person and what kind of your background is if you have tech experience if you have no tech experience either way it's fine and um, because a lot of people that join our cohorts have never done any coding before um so it's really you know it's just I wouldn't worry too much about it and then they'll go into the stage where they'll take the last you to do a couple of challenges and um, slash so you to go on code academy and code wars and learn a bit of Ruby. Um, so if you're thinking about applying, maybe learn a bit of Ruby before you actually call, might be a bit helpful for you in, in that process. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Thanks, Nikki. Yeah, I'll just like reiterate that, um, yeah, it's good if you have a bit of like early knowledge of programming or, you know, if you just like tried a few things, maybe on things like Code Academy or Code Wars before, but uh, you don't you don't need any extra knowledge. So. Um, it's good, but it's not necessarily a require rate as well because the course is designed for beginners. Um, there's another question. So um this anonymous attendee says, let's see, let's say you apply for an apprenticeship from organization one and you started the application process. However, organization two opens their application. Can you uh, proceed to apply? Yeah, absolutely. You can apply for as many uh, apprenticeships as you want. It's you're not gonna be um judged or no one's gonna sort of try and put you in one of I mean obviously you're only gonna be accepted for one or the other but at the same time um there's no quorums on our team on the admissions team if you want to do that we actually usually encourage people to apply for as many apprenticeships as possible because they can be quite competitive so I would recommend you do that and it's also just good practice um to do as many applications as possible um so someone has asked if I aim to join the course starting May when is the deadline to apply um it's well with the deadline um it really depends on how quickly the cohort fills up so for example if we have a couple of spaces left two weeks before if you apply and then you get everything done you do your challenges on Code Wars and Code Academy but in those two weeks you can essentially start them in the May cohort 
So it's really dependent on, like, for example, next week our main cohort could fill up because 24 people might want to be on that cohort. Um, so your best bet is to actually, um, when you book a call with admissions, um, and there's an option to do that on our website, um, just maybe ask them what the kind of uh, what kind of spaces are available in May, and it'll give you a better idea of how much time you have, um, do you know, to get organised to do your interviews and applications. Okay, um, Antho's asked, you guys are great, and I would love to have my boot camp with you. I can't wait to be mentored and trained by makers. Challenging though, but worth it. I hope you guys will make it doable. <laughs> well, that's Thanks, Lou. That's, that's <laughs> Lou. So, um, Lou's probably the one who has got the control on that one. So we, no, no, the coaches. It, it's it's teamwork. So teamwork. hopefully it's not only it's not only me. But, but, they, uh, but they do see the tech side of things as the um. I we're we're more the you know there's a fun side and then there's you know the tech fun but it's also you know it'll be challenging but we we have a lot of um practices you know like uh, emotional intelligence modules and uh, we have meditation that helps make things a bit easier when you're a bit stressed out about the work and um yeah we we as stressful as you get learning the coding and everything um I think makers is a bit different from other boot camps in that sense because um well we've been told that we're better because we focus a lot um on um what do you call it, soft skills as well um and not just completely focused on the tech aspect um anonymous attendees asked you work with organizations to offer sponsorship schemes or makers offer the in offer this every year so with our sponsorship places um we work with organizations such as code bar um coding black females uh islamic makers um and in tech she can so we i know that with code bar we were offering um i think it was 12 places this year and then with coding black females it was 24 places up until the end of 2023 so we do um offer a good amount each year um so if you want to get involved with communities i think it's fairly i think it's fairly easy you can just start coming to events and a lot of the time we will host events for those communities so you can actually come in and see the space you can come in and meet all of us before you apply um but yeah we do we do have a fair amount of scholarships available yeah i would say definitely come in uh like some day so you meet some staff so maybe alumni and it's just like a good way to i guess connect and, and see what we're doing and stuff like this um sam has just asked are there any resources you'd recommend that would stand an applicant in better stead of being successful um i suppose it's the you know resources wise you might be better to answer that in terms of coding yeah I, I guess there would be two things in terms of like purely technical stuff or coding um i wouldn't say there needs to be too much obviously it's, it's good if you have some exposure to programming or to you know even some project or exercises that you build or even if you try to beat yourself even if it's just like a few hours of you know something uh, like code war scatters or stuff like this but i think what's really important as well is more like the mindsets that you will really be motivated to learn but also that you'll be able to constantly reflect on your progress and ask yourself the questions how well did i do what do i need to, where do i need to focus my efforts next um, how can i get better tomorrow how can i just continuously you know sort of get better at this and, and try to work on these things um, this is sort of a mindset that is also like a skill that you can grow it's not necessarily something you need to have but having that motivation and that sort of approach to things and to learning in general is probably one of the most important things that I think we, we look for. Uh, not only like, you know, any early technical like knowledge or things like this. Uh, but hopefully that does answer your question. Amazing. Thank you. Um, okay, so I was asking, are the boot camps strictly, strictly on site? Uh, no, we do um, two weeks on, two weeks off, I believe it's still, still the same with all, all our courses are hybrid. Yeah, so uh, I think from now all courses are hybrid or most mm -hmm. courses are hybrid. Uh, there might be some courses uh, which are still fully remote. Uh, for I don't have the details of it and the date, so that's something again that the admissions team would um likely be able to answer better uh but but definitely no they're not all strictly on site and you 
uh, there's always a bit of like a hybrid, even in, in this court, who you just seen tonight. Uh, a lot of them were on site, a lot of them were also remote. And as you can see, the, um, they also presented for some of them remotely as well. So there's always some sort of flexibility in, in there as well. Oh. Um, next question Do you teach cloud engineering or just back end? Where are your offices located? What city? Um, so I can answer the office one. Uh, we're located on uh, Scrutton Street, which is just around the corner from Old Street Station in Shoreditch, London. Um, so yeah, we'll be there for the foreseeable, I'm sure. Um, I think the cloud engineering you can probably answer. Yeah. yeah. For for the first part of the question, at the moment, um, it's the only sort of way to um get training from us in cloud engineering or what we call DevOps as well is for an apprenticeship. So we, we, we do offer some apprenticeships in uh, on, on that track. Um, it's not actually included in the sort of like academy bootcamp um, um, where this course, for example, you've just seen tonight has, has just gone through. Uh, so yeah, that's kind of like the current uh, style of things for now. Ooh, let's see if we've got any more questions coming in. Okay, next question. Is there an age limit for the apprenticeships? Um, absolutely not. No, we have all ages. We have people who um, to be quite young. Uh, it's very rare that they're, you know, quite young. So a lot of... Um, our applicants want our career changers. So, you know, usually between the ages of like um, 25 to, I mean, like there's few people that have, I'm pretty sure actually retired. <laughs> and I don't know if they did the bootcamp for their friendship, but we get people who in um, all ages. So yeah, nothing to worry about there. And that's not gonna limit you at all. Any more questions? So many of you are in China. Let's wait a time. Let's see if more questions are coming in. Yeah. Now is the time. No question is silly. Anything you want to ask or prep? Even 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 like questions. What was there was a question around was there a piano? I think oh yeah. Of his... Oh yeah, people. Someone asked there was a piano. <laughs> and there, there is a piano, but yeah. <laughs> and there's there's drums and there's we do yoga in the office on Wednesdays. Any question? Uh, okay, so what are anonymous attendees asking? What are the costs in comparison to the apprenticeships to the boot camp? Do you require prior experience before joining either? Um, so basically, for the uh, boot camp, it's eight thousand five hundred per person. We do offer um, a discount for um, women and um, they, but for the apprenticeship, it's. Basically, you get paid from day one. So you will join a company and we front load the training on the boot. So you basically, you essentially on the apprenticeship, you join a boot camp um, and we front load the training. And then basically that means when you join the company, you're ready to work, but you'll be getting a salary from day one. So you don't have to pay anything. Like no, there's no upfront cost when you're doing an apprenticeship. However, the boot camp, you do pay for the boot camp, but you, when you finish it, we actually have um, several teams and makers who uh, work extremely hard to put you in with jobs. So we have career spheres, we have talks, um, companies coming in to talk to you. We are we have the partnerships team who are meeting up with companies who actively want to work with makers. So it's not just that you do the boot camp and you go, you know, and you know, fend for yourself. You're still actively part of the community and you have lots of coaches readily available um, careers coaches who are um, helping you with interviews your cv prep and all of that good stuff so um yeah that's the, that's the main difference between between the two uh, so, so the second part of the question which is do we require prior experience before joining either oh. i guess the answer is no in any case like we don't we don't require any experience in 
uh, in software or anything like this. Yeah. A lot of people are, you know, like I said before, they're career changers. So, you know, people have been like nurses and, you know, like firemen. I don't know, weird. There's probably been like ridiculous amounts of different um, yeah. professions like that have come in and they've not done anything before so as long as you have um you know a knack for problem solving and you really enjoy it I think that's the main thing they look for and our coaches will teach you the rest um, and you'll when you do your interviews um our team will, will explain a lot to you as well um what are the chances Andrew says what are the chances to get employed as a junior after the boot camp especially with the new advances in the AI field? Um, I guess that question a lot nowadays. Um, I would say, um, I mean, I can, I can speak for the second part of the question. I, I don't feel like these advances for now are any sort of big threat to it. It's uh, like a tool much like you would use Google to research things or much like you would look on Stack Overflow or other like websites to get some resources or things like this. Um, it's definitely not going to replace um, a software engineer and the work that they do and the, the, the intellectual work that they do and the value in the team as well. So, um, and I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. So that's, again, my personal opinion. It might be wrong, but for now, I definitely feel that um, this is not changing much to chances of being hired as a, as a junior engineer. Um, I'd like to talk more about it, but I'm going to keep it brief for this one. I don't know if you want yeah, to I mean, to be honest, with, you know, being hired as a junior after the boot camp, it, it, it's like any, any industry, it goes up and down. Uh, we used to actually have a 100% guaranteed job rate after the boot camp, and that obviously had to be taken off because of the pandemic. But then it went, it kind of shot up straight afterwards. So it's very much, um, we have a really amazing rate of, um, students getting jobs. We actually have an alumni survey on our LinkedIn. Um, so if you look back at our LinkedIn in probably about a month ago, um, I actually don't have the link with me right now, um, but I can probably actually send it in the follow-up email um, on, uh, on Monday after this. Uh, and it'll basically show you, uh, it has a very detailed percentage wise of how many people get hired after the bootcamp, what time they had to wait, Mid interviews, and then also where they are now. So how far they've actually progressed in that company. Um, and you know into uh, senior positions, so I'll make sure that I pop that in there. Nice. Let's see if we got any more questions coming in. Oh wow, that's sort of wow. <laughs> okay. Um, so anonymous has asked, what pro programming languages do you test for prior to joining IE Ruby? How do you recruit for the apprentice? I should. I'll go question by question. Yeah, yeah. You, let's, you let's first, first one. one. There's <laughs> yeah. questions in one here. So. Um, so we don't test, uh, I think, uh, I mean, we do, we do ask you to complete the Code Academy course and complete a few Code Wars letters. I don't remember what the exact like, number is, but uh, this is, uh, as of now, only in Ruby, so you don't need to know any programming languages or any other programming languages or anything, um, aside doing this sort of like task prior to, um, to, to going through the admission process. Um, so that's, that's that. Um, the second question is how do you recruit for the apprenticeships? Uh, for example, are these are there tests conducted beforehand? Um, so as I said previously, anyone who does the apprenticeship is essentially going to be put on the boot camp, the same boot camp that everyone on the academy is put on. So you'll basically any uh, the process to um we maybe so makers have our process to recruit an apprentice. So we put you through those same challenges. However, each company might have a different process, so they might um, want you to do some other technical tests. Um, so I'm trying to think like say like Monzo you know, or like any banks or whatever, they might want you to do specific coding tests in the, the way that they code. So it, it, it could vary, but essentially our, our interviewing technique is essentially the same for the um, for both academy and friendships. Um, and I'm um, sorry for the recruiting part of it. Um, we basically have, when anyone signs up to do an apprenticeship, so um, if anyone applies, and then they don't get that one, they get put into a pool. So basically any time uh, another friendship comes out, we will get in contact with anyone in the pool and um, sort of give them a, an alert that we have a new one available. And we also post them on LinkedIn a lot. We post them on all our social media channels. Um, so definitely get us on LinkedIn if you're looking, if you want to see sort of 
make sure you're the first one because that's just where we first put it on. Um, and yeah, that's I think that's is that answer everything. Uh, there's another one which is what is the average salary post bootcamp and apprenticeship? Okay, so um, the average salary like varies and you'll see this in the um, alumni survey usually I mean it kind of I think London based the average was 32 and outside of London I think it was a little bit lower but we also do we have a um, on our all our Slack channels we can see what our bootcamp graduates get and they often there's sometimes they get you know 45k or 50k and then some people get a lot lower they get 25 so honestly it's really up and down it's but but we would like to stay in the middle when we give an average about 30 32 um for our apprenticeships there's some apprenticeships that are 17k there was one recently that was 17 but there's also others that go up to 30 i would say 30 i would say 20 maybe 25 for k is the average i think for for apprenticeships but it, like you know it, it can go up and down Mm -hmm. So when do both the apprenticeships and the bootcamp starts? Um, we have an apprenticeship. We have a bootcamp every month. So we have one one academy bootcamp every month. Um, and with the apprenticeships, um, I suppose it, it just depends really. Um, some of sometimes we can have a few apprenticeships a month. Um, because we have four different kinds of apprenticeships now. Um, and sometimes. We won't have an apprenticeship cohort a month. Um, so I can't really give a defined answer on that. It just it just depends on our client side. Yeah, I think I think I guess getting in touch if you want to get more info, get in touch with admissions because they'll likely have more sort of up-to-date data and more detailed data as that yeah. Uh, so there's another question here. Can you explain so the pool again? I believe that was yeah, apprenticeship. Yeah, so our apprenticeship pool is we call we basically call that our pool of people who are sitting there waiting for an apprenticeship opportunity. Um and we um usually how it works um is if some if you see, say for example, you saw on our LinkedIn that there was an apprenticeship available, if you applied, you automatically get added into this pool. And what happens is if you don't get that an interview for that one or don't get the job or you know, we will just contact you afterwards. Uh, if we've got a new one up, so say we had a new one for a new company, we'd say, right. hey, do you want to apply for this so that you can kind of be the first one who um, gets an opportunity to to apply. Thanks. Any more questions? Okay. Um, you have to go through the testing again. I guess that's a follow up from um, one. So, in order to go through the test, I mean, that, um, that's a really good question, actually. Um, for the, if you pass, if you do it, if you pass everything, you don't have to do it again. Um, you know, that this is a question that I've been asked before, and that I remember asking admissions, and they said, you know, it's as long as it's not been, I think, over six months, you you're fine. I think as long as it's up to date, you know, you you would you won't have to do it again. Um, and but then that being said, that's on our side with the with the if it's for the apprenticeship you might have to, you know, you'll obviously have to continue to do the company's tests if they have them, um, which I'm sure they might do. So um, you're, you're going to have to prepare in some way to do some sort of technical exam. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what differentiates Mayfish from other well-known coding boot camps? I suppose uh, what we what we like to say is like the sort of emotional intelligence aspect of it. Um, we're very much growth mindset, and um, you know, we we're well aware that the people that are coming to us are nervous, they're career changers, and we want to make this process as um, you know, nurturing as possible. Um, we have a lot of people on board in this company who it's made basically their job to make sure that you 
you know have access to support if you're having a bad day you're like I this code just makes no sense you know you can sit and chat to um one of our coaches and just hash it out um, there's a few times I've heard people say you shouldn't say you know I thought I was gonna leave and then I spoke to this person and now I'm you know I'm about to finish makers you know it's, that's kind of how we work I suppose um and yeah I think also I don't know how it is with other every other coding boot camp but I know that our careers team works extremely hard to get people jobs after we would never we are we, we want we're part of a massive community you know where we um we we don't just want to leave them after they finish it we really make an effort to get them jobs after and I don't know if um other boot camps go to that link um that our teams do uh, in terms of that support I don't know if there's anything you have to have any coaches yes yes it could be other things but what i want to mention is sort of our approach to education and to making sure that the the, the curriculum that we have stays relevant to the industry and that we continuously improve it and that we continue to see improve the way to teach people and when i say teaching not as in just like throwing knowledge at them and and you know making powerpoints and things like this but really making them go through some challenges that are difficult enough and challenging enough for them to be able to learn the right processes and to be able to reflect on them and to, uh, again, not only teach tech uh, and programming, but also teach people how to learn and to give them the tools to then direct their own learning. And if they need to join like a new company or if they want to take on a new project, and they need to use a technical stack or programming language that they haven't been using before. They have the tools to look at documentations online and look for resources of all the right people to sort of take on their own learning because it, it doesn't stop after three or four months, right? It's it's really a lifelong learning journey that you're that you're on uh, once you get into software. So you need to have the right tools and the right mindset. And I think that's also one of the big strengths that we have is that we tend to um, really share that with with people and to try to give them the tools to to do that as well i mean to add to that as well you know a lot of companies whenever they come back to hire they always really enjoy the way that makers work um they think that makers people are a lot more chilled out <laughs> more than normal software developers and i think that has a lot to say about how they were trained um so that's just that kind of last little note about um about it but yeah i hope that answers your question I've got a few minutes left, so if anyone wants any last questions, just fire them through. We'll wait for another another little twenty seconds. Cool. Um, I think that will be us then. We hope everyone has a great weekend um, and really enjoyed joining us for Demo Day. Um, if you fancy joining any of our other um, events, we have a Taster Tuesdays on the next ones on 18th of April where you'll learn some coding from our coaches. Um, and then we also have info sessions on that Tuesday before. So um, uh, yeah, just um, go on our social media and you'll be able to sign up to those. Um, all right. All right. Thanks for joining everyone. Bye.